Hello, Mr. T Mr. Ellisberg. Uh, Ellisberg, it's, it's nice to meet you. Uh, do you think uh, the Bush administration uh, handled the 9-11 the situation uh, responsibly? Well, of course not. Uh, as Richard Clark, who was chief of counterterrorism for Bush and his father, and for uh, Clinton as well, as a matter of fact, has said in his book, uh, Against All Enemies, Bush's leadership prior to 9-11 was terrible. It practically ignored all the dangers of uh, terrorism that Clark was trying to warn him about. And his response after 9-11 was worse in that he chose to attack, to prepare to attack, and actually to attack a country that had nothing to do with 9-11, and a country uh, which would, uh, whose attack would strengthen Osama bin Laden's forces, the Al-Qaeda, by finding recruits for it and by reducing cooperation with the United States would drastically increase the dangers to the United States. So his leadership could hardly have been worse in terms of policy, in terms of aims, and his competence seems to have been incredibly bad uh, in every respect except the actual blitzkrieg invasion of Iraq itself, but his handling of the occupation and the resistance, and in general, his, uh, his dealings with terrorism have been both incompetent and criminal. What do you think is the cause of the increased terrorism since the late 1970s? The, uh, I don't, certainly don't know all the causes that go into it. And I should say, by the way, that I don't expect it to be very successful in the larger strategic aims that, uh, such as they have, uh, though in terms of satisfying feelings of revenge, of uh, retaliation, uh, it is successful in that extent at great human cost. Now, why the, fe the desire for revenge? Well, more recently, the occupation of Iraq itself, of course, gives rise to a resistance movement. But uh, if you, and it was inevitable that it would do that, but going back earlier, the Israel-Palestine cause, uh, conflict there, is obviously a great cause for humiliation and rage and frustration. Uh, this combined, of course, with uh, uh, very bad economic conditions and social conditions in the Muslim world, which uh, make it easier to recruit people for extremist causes, and a turn to fundamentalist religion, which to some extent is happening even in the United States, in, in, um, but uh, very much so, in fact. But in the Muslim world, the uh, turn toward fundamentalism re reflects a kind of frustration with their existing regimes, uh, which in turn have been supported by the United States, very definitely, specifically in Saudi Arabia, where obviously Osama is uh, particularly concerned about the American support for the regime and the presence of U.S. troops. Those have been withdrawn now, but the U.S. continues to support a regime that Osama bin despises. Uh, what, what do you think uh, about that uh, in, uh, the Kerry Bush debate, uh, uh, talking about the situation in Iraq, uh, Bush stated that uh, talking about these issues only hates the enemy. What do you think about the response like that? Say, aids the enemy? Well, I'm saying that the Bush policy uh, is so supportive of Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden that uh, it would not be unreasonable to infer that somehow there was some kind of league between them. I don't believe that. But in fact, the, the fact is that uh, the appearance is there because it is uh, George Bush, above all, who's giving aid and comfort to Al-Qaeda and Osama. Uh, there's a similarity. I think that Sharon, in effect, strengthens Hamas, the more extreme and violent um, opposition that he faces. And likewise, Hamas strengthens Sharon. And you could say that Osama, in his turn, is the greatest aid and comfort to George Bush in his uh, authoritarian tendencies. So you have this kind of marriage of convenience, uh, sym symbiotic. And those who question these policies are actually uh, under, have the potential of uh, undercutting the support for terrorism. Uh, how, how 
come you think uh, the danger of nuclear proliferation is greater than ever? The danger of nuclear proliferation. What about it? Uh, how, how come you think that the danger is greater? Than oh, well, the I think the danger is greater for a number of reasons. First, it has extremely low priority under Bush. Whatever he says rhetorically, he's taking almost no steps to reduce the danger of proliferation. For example, he's cut the funding for measures to safeguard the Russian poorly guarded nuclear weapons, which are the most logic, obvious source of weapons for terrorists in the world. Uh, second, uh, he's chosen to support uncritically the regime in Pakistan, which has been kind of a supermarket for weapons uh, to possible proliferators. But above all, uh, Bush specifically, and, and his Republican Party, has favored the renewal of testing, preparation for testing, and the threat of nuclear weapons in such a way as to encourage other countries to want to get them to defend against the U.S. or their neighbors, or to make threats of the kind the U.S. is making. Uh, the very attack on Iraq, I think, un under uh, gives straight support to those people in the world who say we have to get nuclear weapons if we were to deter the U.S. from attacking them. And the contrast with North Korea supports that. They can say, well, North Korea has weapons and therefore they're not getting attacked. Iraq uh, was attacked because it didn't have nuclear weapons. So he's creating the incentive to get them. And uh, so long as the U.S. takes the attitude, we are entitled to an indefinite number of weapons, tens of thousands, and to prepare for renewed testing and actually to test and to threaten them. But others can't have any. Uh, others can't test at all or develop at all. That has no normative weight at all. In other words, that doesn't set standards for the rest of the world. They, that's ridiculous. And it's, an, it's virtually a provocation to proliferation. I think it uh, was uh, right of the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, to uh, remain loyal to the Bush administration. Uh, because I, I, I saw him as uh, maybe the chance uh, to avoid uh, yeah. the war in the right. Mm -hmm. Well, he clearly uh, has shown in backgrounders and comments that he made that he is the least committed to the war on Iraq of all the members of the administration and probably the most critical of it. You can't tell entirely. His position may have been more than he wanted UN support for the war uh, than to be totally against the war. He may not have been so much against the war, or he may have been. We don't know because he won't speak candidly. Now your question is, uh, would he have done better to resign and speak uh, openly? Well, partly that depends on what he would have said or how opposed he was. But let's assume that he really was very opposed, which he may, he may have been. Should he have then uh, quit? I do believe that he could have averted the war by doing that, and that would have been of vast importance, of course, not just by quitting, but by speaking out with documentary evidence. If he had opened his own safe to Congress and to the world, I think he could have averted the war. But that's also true of hundreds of other people in the administration. He, he could best have done that. At the same time, he'd be giving up his influence with the president, such as it is. And he would probably tell himself and his wife in explaining why he doesn't leave that he would, if he left, the president would hear only from Cheney, Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, Pearl, Bolton, Fife, all the advocates, the, the crazy. Apparently he's taken to calling them the crazies, the nuts, the loonies. Uh, that's his attitude. Well, if he left the government, he could say to himself, it would be true, that the government wouldn't even hear Powell's voice at all. It's hard to judge from outside how much difference that would make. It's possible that he made the right choice by staying in, even assuming uh, that uh, he would have been overruled. He probably tells himself that he could not have stopped the war. Uh, I think that he could have. I obviously can't, you know, don't have the last word on that either. But I can imagine his doing things that he probably didn't imagine doing and that was not only resigning, but speaking out against his boss. He probably just couldn't imagine doing such a thing. And given that, I can't say he was wrong to stay in, but I wish it had occurred to him that he actually could have done something that no one has ever done. Not me, not anybody. And that is leave before the war with documents, present those to the world, 
Uh, it's time for someone to do that. Oh, without any question. Uh, I think that um, uh, there's no question that they have earned themselves indictment and prosecution at the International Criminal Court. And I think that's a major reason why they have not wanted to ratify uh, the International Criminal Court. I don't think they are only protecting sergeants and lieutenants from prosecution or privates. I think they have very much in mind that they don't want to be indicted. And they would be indicted. Uh, they should be indicted right now. Um, we haven't seen the trial. We haven't seen testimony under oath on both sides. Uh, so it's too soon to prejudge it and say they're, they're let's say, uh, innocent until proven guilty. I think they have earned the right to be tried and to allow themselves to uh, be tested in court. But it would seem to me on the information we have right now that crimes have been committed, crimes against humanity, war crimes, aggressive war, and war crimes have both been committed. And uh, uh, in the first instance, w we don't need to say which individuals are most responsible. Let that be determined by a trial. But there's every presumption that there have been crimes and that the people at the top are the first suspects. Do you have, uh, do you have any theories on uh, what, uh, what the Bush administration's real agenda is? Yes, uh, you can only conjecture to some extent, but I think there are a variety of incentives. Uh, the oil is at the top of that, but it's not so much oil uh, for our own cars, let's say, though that is important, but control of the world's oil. I think that uh, these people have very ambitious strategic objectives to run the world. I think they want to be a world empire such as the world has never seen, actually. And in the course of that, nothing could be more important than controlling everyone else's oil. So I think they want to control the oil of the whole Middle East, not just Iraq. And for that, the bases in Iraq and elsewhere, in Afghanistan and in the uh, Caspian area, are all very important. <clears throat> uh, so the Afghan war played into that as well, even though there isn't um, oil, much oil in Afghanistan itself. But it's a strategic location and, a, and an excuse for having bases in the Caspian and elsewhere, very important. Second, uh, then we, so we have the bases as a real goal uh, in the Middle East. Again, you could substitute for those, but uh, that's the, a very convenient location. Uh, third, there's the interests of Israel as seen by Sharon. This administration feels very close to uh, Likud and Sharon uh, in their strategic. I don't think that is very good for Israel, but they do. And uh, I think that consideration is significant. Uh, fourth, they are playing to an important constituency in America, domestic constituency, which is uh, the Christian fundamentalist right, which has the ideology, or the, the theology, the doctrine, that uh, the second coming will be speeded, of the Messiah, uh, will be speeded up by a greater Israel. Uh, it's a widely held, I would say, crazy belief, uh, as crazy as the beliefs of fundamentalists in other religions, uh, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim. And uh, uh, one generally refrains, I've refrained from criticizing such beliefs on the grounds that they're honestly held and everyone has a right to their belief. Well, they do have a right to their belief, uh, we can respect that right, but not necessarily to respect the beliefs, and in this case, the particular beliefs, and in this case, um, these beliefs are extremely dangerous. And I'm afraid that they are a political factor because Bush counts on them as part of his, uh, what will get him elected. Uh, do you fear that the Bush administration will become a fascist dictatorship? Yeah, I think that uh, the combination of Bush in, and Al-Qaeda is very dangerous for American democracy. If Al-Qaeda produces another large terrorist incident in the U.S., which I do expect, uh, then I think Bush will seize that as an opportunity for essentially a fascist reordering of the United States in the sense of an extremely authoritarian, militaristic, um, in many ways racist, 
and uh, with respect to the Middle East, I think that the Middle Easterners and Muslims, Arabs, in the U.S. will be likely be detained in detention concentration camps in very large numbers or deported and tortured. Uh, extreme, extreme measures will be taken, and that includes people who he sees as sympathizing with their cause, which means disagreeing with his policy, such as myself. Uh, I think there's a very good likelihood that after the next terrorist incident or the next one after that, that I will find myself in a concentration camp. Not because I'm unpatriotic or against democracy, but quite the contrary, because I'm against fascism. Well, that's too long a story but uh, to say in detail, but very simply to save lives, American and Vietnamese, to shorten the war. And uh, the war that was, I knew was going to increase, uh, contrary to public statements. So I hope to uh, tell some truths that would undermine support for an expanded war. Yes, I regret very much that I didn't do it much earlier as early as 64, 65, before the big war had really begun. I think it, it, I, even I uh, might have had a chance with the documents I had to have averted that war. And that means that hundreds of others could have done it well, too, of course, cabinet-level people like Secretary McNamara, but um, like Secretary Powell now. But um, I do regret that I didn't think of doing it then. It wasn't that I thought of it and rejected it. I just didn't occur to me. To survive at all? Yeah, to survive at all. It's a very challenging question. A possible yes, or I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Uh, you could just as well ask, is it possible for humanity to survive much longer? I think the two may be closely related. I think that a spread of authoritarian, highly armed regimes, empires in a nuclear age is a very bad prospect for humanity, even worse than uh, nuclear-armed democracies, which are also dangerous, as we've already seen. Uh, it can get worse, in other words. But uh, in both questions, yes, possible. Not likely, but possible. I don't think it's likely humanity has another thousand years, and that's you know, a blink of an eye in evolutionary terms. Hard for me to believe. Uh, there may, a thousand years from now, be some humans, even a lot of humans, but nothing like what we have now, not, not five or six billion humans. I don't believe that. And not in cities. That's a very gloomy prospect. But I think it's possible that we could do better than that. It's certainly possible that we can do better than a nuclear holocaust in the next 20, 30, or 50 years. Though the likelihood is not great of avoiding that. But I'm devoting my life to try to increase that likelihood and to prolong uh, our human existence here. And by the same token, I do want to preserve democracy. I think the prospects of it are gloomy. I think for at least the short run in the next 20 and 30 years, democracy in America may be in its uh, twilight. Because I think the reaction in my country to terrorist um, attacks and to the fear that they cause is likely to be in a, in a uh, move toward a very authoritarian government. And that, in turn, will mean death for many people in the world, not just Americans. So that's a, a gloomy prospect, just as the world faced a gloomy prospect in 1939 and 1940. Um, I think that's where we are now. Or to go back earlier, I should say more like 1932 in Germany. Um, but, and yet, was it possible to have avoided that in Germany? I don't think you can say it was impossible. People didn't do what they could have done, and I think we have to learn from that and do better. Is there anything, is there anything you would like to add? <laughs> well, I would like to add that we, we have a better prospect in the world than, uh, than I've just described. But um, uh, I do want to emphasize, I am an optimist. I think we have a chance to postpone and to avoid these things. And that gives us a responsibility as humans 
to do what we can, and that generally means more than we're actually doing at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have a card or? Those are good questions. Uh, you have a card or a finger from what?